Well, gentlemen, ladies, uh, this is uh, the end of our show tonight. Uh, uh, so we will now go to the after show. Uh, Mr. Clark Cooney, who normally does it, is uh, still fishing. Uh, so you're stuck with me for the after show. And as usual, uh, I will ask the simple question that Clark always asks. Is anybody new that hasn't been here before that would like to say anything? And since there's not, does anybody that has been here before want to say anything? Already said it. <laughs> well, uh, I need John to hurry up and get me some information to me because if we're ending the show, I won't be able to chat with him. So, John, <laughs> please, uh, please do get your info up here as soon as possible, my friend. Well, we'll keep it going I, for a little bit. Just so or, Alan, maybe you could just put your information in and he can get it uh, oh, and okay. send it to you. Well, that's true. I'll do that. Let me put that in there. Be particularly before uh, before Phil shuts us down from the uh, <laughs> recording. Okay. Good. Uh, there's John's info. No, it's not. There's a typo in it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, that's okay. We don't read Australian anyway. It was the Australian to U.S. translation that didn't yeah. work too well. <laughs> no, my fingers aren't working. That too old well. Google translator. Yeah. <laughs> but he have one of his letters upside down. <laughs> so I've, I've got J.K.A. Garrity at one. No, Earth no. Net. Revised version coming. Okay. <laughs> Try version two. J.K. Garrity at oneearth.net. One earth at oneearth.net. All right, excellent. Okay. Off by okay. your email. If you're, if you're Alan Rogers at Bakersfield, I'm about to send you a direct message with my home address and phone number. Oh, good. That's perfect. I'll go ahead and fire you an email so you'll have my email address. Okay. John, don't, don't, don't forget to tell him whether you want H, O, S, or O scale. Uh, it's going to have to be O scale. I'm trying to work out how the blazes I can fit it into an Australian colliery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've got them. I've got them hanging on the wall. O scale it is. Okay. All right. Well, you're lucky man, John. That's a nice kid. Okay. I'm going to bid you all adieu, and I'm going to pass this over to Pat. So we'll see you all next week. Have a good one. Hey, yeah, Ciao. We'll see you, Phil. Thanks, Bye now. Phil. Bye, Phil. Glad Take you're care, better. Phil. All right, guys. Phil's really been through a lot. No question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm telling you. Been through a lot. Well, next week, we have got a really full show. I figure it's probably going to be at least two and a half hours next time to get everything in. And uh, it's just, it's just a, a long show tomorrow, next time. I might take the day off. <laughs> hey, Jim, I'd like to just mention, I want to, I want to thank Ken and Alan and Pat for helping me work out the procedure for getting all those names into the wheel uh, <laughs> because there's, there's no easy way to copy them out of the list of participants in zoom. Yeah. Um, uh, Ken has a, a, a good method that requires using a Mac and Ken's type of knowledge, which I don't have either. Um, yeah. But we worked out a way that I was able to get all of them typed in before the time limit of course it, it took three it tries to get a winner but <laughs> yeah. you did a great job did earl ever come back is he just gone or what um no he's he's still logged on but his his uh his workbench is empty yep well, we gave everybody a long time, I thought, to... Yeah, uh, yeah I thought so, too. So, 
I'm glad we finally got a winner, though. That's great. Well, they'll be crying tomorrow when they hear. Mm. <laughs> All, right. Oh. All right, guys, I'm going to go. We've had our daughter and fiance staying with us for two weeks. And I'll tell you, having a couple of, of <laughs> young adults in the house takes some getting used to. Yeah, <laughs> goes to show yes. you we're getting older. <laughs> See no, you all just, later. We're just getting better. Yeah, thanks, that's right. Thanks for doing. Uh, it. Is, is, is sure anyone thanks. who whinges about getting older, <laughs> yeah. remind them what the alternative is. Yeah, yeah that's the truth. <laughs> really appreciate you doing all this, Greg. And thanks very much, Alan. I, I right. didn't see yeah. this one coming out of left field. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm looking forward to you getting this. I'm I'm sending myself a. Uh, I'm just copying all your information here. So, good. All right. Um, I can actually ring you basically for unlimited phone call length phone calls. Part of my internet deal is I can ring the U.S. for free as I as long as I like. Oh, that's nice. Yes. It, it does have some benefits, but it is at a higher rate than most people are paying. <laughs> sure. <laughs> John, are you all locked down over there at all? Or uh, No, not really. Uh, mind you, the current situation is about as bad as it's ever been. Uh, I think yesterday there was about 4,000 went down in one day with it. Uh, that's across the state. Uh, we've got, I think, around about 1,500 to 2,000 in hospital, but not many of them are critical, thank heavens. What area are, are you in, John? I'm in New South Wales. I'm uh, about an hour south of Sydney. Okay. So um, the area I'm in the city of probably uh, 250,000 people, and I'm in one of the suburbs. Uh, it's a, a fair-sized lump of a port city that uh, I live beside. And I'm within uh, 10 minutes of the local steelworks. It's the biggest one in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, wow. I spent 20-plus years there. So anyone wants to know anything about iron and steel, talk to me. <laughs> yeah. Been there, done it. Got the T-shirt. Everywhere from coke ovens, blast furnaces, steel-making shops, rolling mills, Tin plate. And and what are you modeling? Uh, I'm modeling a two foot gauge model of the Coromel Colliery <laughs> incline. So you're not doing a steel mill? No. <laughs> there, there is a very good reason why I'm not doing a steel mill. Um, at home, I've got a plan of about a quarter of the steelworks. Mm hmm. It's on a four foot by three foot sheet and it's one twelve hundredth scale. Wow. Yeah, wow. Uh, the rolling mill, the hot strip mill at Port Kimball is better than a mile and a half long. Holy crap. There's yeah. no there's no way to to <laughs> scale that down. No. Um, the Walther's blast furnace. Is about a thousand to two thousand ton a day blast furnace in HO, rough wow. enough. Working on what the sizes across the half are. Yeah. The two furnaces I was working on, one was better than four and a half thousand ton a day. The other one was doing five and a half thousand ton a day. Um, when number five was built, it was in the top twenty blast furnaces of the world in terms of size. Uh, she's a little bit outgunned now, but. It's still producing better than 5,000 ton a day. And uh, it was built in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, it's had almost a continuous run and it's still going. So, um, yes, um, to give you an idea in terms of quantities of raw material for every ton of malt and iron out the bottom, and that's 5,500 tonne of iron out the bottom. It takes about seven tonne of raw materials. Mm. Uh, that's an awful lot of coal that's got to be cooked into coke each day. There's an awful lot of iron ore that's got to be dropped in the top, and an, an awful lot of limestone that goes in with it. There's a flux to 
make the slag to get rid of the phosphorus and sulfur impurities out of the oh. iron. Yeah. So your iron comes out liquid at around about 14. It's got to be better than 1450. If you wind up with cold iron coming out, the sulfur and the phosphor level goes up too high and you can't make good steel out of it. Uh, well, I spent better than 10 years across production planning and steel making grades from a daily alphabet. <laughs> Jeez. So, um, yeah, um, there's a reason I don't model Port Gambler. <laughs> I ain't got the real estate. I'd need a jumbo jet hanger <laughs> and yeah. an unlimited amount of money. I figure with a million bucks, I could just about do it. It would cost me a couple of hundred bucks, a thousand bucks for the land to put it on. Probably another one or two hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars for the building. And the other one or two hundred thousand dollars would go on rolling stock uh, and, and structures. And I wouldn't live long enough to build it. <laughs> I'd have to be paying people to build it. <laughs> So, so you haven't been able to win the lottery yet. I mean, here we are. It's Wednesday here, but yeah. you're already in Thursday. Yeah, and it doesn't quite work like that. Unless I could know what you're going to do Thursday, then I'd have a chance. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> How good's your crystal ball? Mine's going foggy. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to expand on something Jim had mentioned me earlier in the farm model world, and I had put in the chat. I'd recommend to anybody that would like to see some excellent modeling to go on YouTube and search Toy Tractor Times, and I'd recommend any of the videos that have Chris Steeb, S-C-E-E-B, in it. Um, he is a two-time national Farm Toy Show award winning for a small scale display. And the last two years in a row, he's won second place in the small scale displays, which are 164 scale for the most part. Uh, I believe 2020, there was an HO scale farm display that was done that I believe took third place. Um, but just check the videos out. Uh, Jim has had some interaction with Chris and has seen the videos, and I highly recommend them. Cool. No, no question about it. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, how, how much is automation, uh, animation uh, playing now, Tony, in, in, that, in your farm modeling? Uh, still not really. There are some some of the really younger individuals that are starting to build radio controlled uh, vehicles yep. in 164 scale using radio controlled HO scale kits and retrofitting them into 164 scale vehicles. Um, you know, on and off throughout the years, there's been gentlemen that have used uh, scene recordings for sounds uh, gentlemen that have lit stuff. Uh, Chris has full intent on lighting everything once yeah. he gets moved to Oklahoma to the house that they're building down there and are able to have all of the displays permanently set up, being as Chris still has every display that he has done for these competitions and they will eventually become the, the town of and sur area surrounding the fictional town of Redlands, Oklahoma. Um, but it's not, uh, how do I want to put this? It's focused on more on the scenery and structures and vehicles compared, you know, the, the same as you'd have for setting the scene and model railroading versus yeah. the actual physical rolling stock and things that move or make sounds. Um, I, it, it's just a different focus on on a portion of the same hobby, and that's, that's, I, that's I don't. Of, go ahead, Jim. Excuse me. Go ahead, Tony. I say I I don't consider myself a farm modeler. I am just a sixty fourth scale modeler, 
I do everything from uh, locomotives and rolling stock to structures, figures, vehicles, you name it. And a lot of the, the farm modelers and toy truck and construction modelers, they'll put the same amount of money and focus and detail into a specific tractor or a specific truck that model railroaders will put into their locomotives. I've seen, well, I, I can't just say I've seen, I have built 164 scale tractors that have, that start off as a 10 or $12 toy and end up being a three to $500 replica when it's all said and done. So they're, you know, it, it's all the same hobby. It just focuses on different aspects of the hobby. But an awful lot of the manufacturers in the model railroad hobby, their, their equipment, their structures, so forth, the parts that they produce are just as applicable to the farm modeling in 164 as they are to model railroad in S scale. And vice versa. And vice versa. And, th and therefore, if those two hobbies could ever get together, they would have one a tremendous amount of buying power to bring to the market. Well, like, like I stated before this meeting started, the, the number of 64th scale modelers, not just farm modelers, but model railroaders, toy truck and construction guys, die cast guys, uh, and the farm guys, just those aspects of it outnumber HO scale modelers two to one and HO scale from what I understand is the largest demographic model, model railroad. Yeah. And, but manufacturers such as Woodland Phoenix, I can give you guys a direct quote from Woodland Phoenix when a group of modelers in 164 scale, specifically the farm toy world, contacted Woodland Phoenix with funding to have some of their figures upscaled and manufactured, produced, and sold at, in S-164, the representative from Woodland Phoenix told them under no uncertain circumstances, and exact quote was, flyer is dead. And that's how a lot of the large manufacturers that are not in S scale see the 164 scale modeling world as it is as flyer. And that's not what it is. There, there's so much of a spread in that scale that it is, I don't even know how to describe what it is. Hmm. Tony, John Garrity, Australia. Mm -hmm. um, some thoughts. Would the Fowler animated chickens in HO do as pullets in, in S? I believe so. I've seen that a lot of stuff that is called HO scale, if you actually start measuring it, scales out closer to uh, 72nd or 64th scale than it does uh, 187th or 100th right. scale. Um, there's a manufacturer. I, I'm going to use a specific example. Um, the JTT Plastics does brick, cinder block, asphalt shingles, and other pattern sheets. Yeah. That if you actually pull a measurement on the brick size, on the block size for the cinder block, on the, on the asphalt shingle, they, they're calling it and selling it and marketing it as HO scale, but it fit, the physical dimension of the pattern is actually S. Yeah, and that, that will also apply to a lot of the corrugated irons that are supposedly HO, the driver scale. Correct. Along with uh, the diamond tread, uh, tread plate pat patterns and a lot of that other stuff are scale out as S, even though they're called HO. Right. Um, just a, a thought for your figures. I'd be approaching someone like Model U um, and there's a couple of other 
3D printers out now who will upsize stuff to 64 scale. There is that. There is a huge demographic for 64 scale figures currently. But this was, you know, five years ago before the 3D printing has taken off as much as it has. Well, certainly there's a group in Australia uh, who will do uh, scales to demand. Uh, certainly, I think there's Model U based out of the UK and there's a Canadian outfit, Mini Prints. Um, all three of them would probably be worthwhile contacting to see whether you can get figures. Now, um, railway figures in overalls could be farm workers in overalls very, very easily. Oh, yeah. Um, Mini Prints, I know, offers that scale. Yep. Um, there's cat paws out of the United States. They do all scales. Um, there's, uh, a gentleman out of, uh, Europe and his name escapes me currently, but he does beautiful 164 scale figures and small diorama pieces. There is, uh, a, uh, a company that is only on Facebook currently by the name of Cornfield Customs. They do some figures, display port uh, stuff, a uh, couple locomotive kits in 164th S that are not available. They're trying to bridge a gap in mm. scales or uh, eras. But the beauty of some of the 3D printed stuff is they're soft plastic. They can be kind of attacked with the scalpel and the arms and hands can be kind of modified to fit the, the machinery very, very easily. Oh, yeah. There's that. And then there's also that a lot of the 3D printed figures anymore are actual scans off of real human beings. Yes. 90, um, approximately 90% of the figures that are available as S scale are from 3D scans. Yeah. Um, the Australian outfit, if you want to make a note of it, is called Andean Models, A-N-D-I-A-N, uh, and they do 3D printing in various scales from uh, basically HO up to uh, G scale. I, I actually have a, a friend down in... Uh, Queensland, who I'll need to uh, get that information to because he, he models 164 scale and he is always looking <laughs> and having okay. something, having something down there help. in Australia is going to help him. In Australia okay. is definitely going to help him out. Glad I and, could help. I'm dropping back to mute. And, and John, who, what's the guy's name that does the painting for them? Ian, I forget his last name. He's the Ian in the Andean. I'm sorry? He's the Ian in the Andean name. A-N-D-I-A-N. Yeah. Um, yes, he's, he's very, very much a narrow gauge modeler as well. And I've forgotten his last name. I'm going to yeah. have to look it up and get back to you. But he is just, a fan if you've ever seen some of the fig figures that he's painted, he is just fantastic. I, I could put up a photo in hang on I don't have Tony a... uh Jamie Bothwell here resident S scaler how you doing I'll bow out oh, and I'm you've got great. To keep talking so, to... uh, I, I got a note the other day I'm you're probably aware of this but the guys up in Minnesota are talking about having kind of gathering convention they're trying to like draw all you folk into the S scale train world you know like uh, they're my friends because they're train guys but they're trying to get the, the farm guys and the truck guys all together for a 164th kind of gathering. Sounded interesting, but uh, I'll be back at work at that point, so I won't be able to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm in pretty good with the group there from Minnesota. Um, you know, uh, Ziska and Tom? Yeah, all up. yeah okay. So, all right. Yep. Yes, I, uh, I've actually been a privy to some of the planning meetings on that 
Okay, cool. I, I figured I saw in the chat you said I saw I saw in the chat you said you kind of knew him, so I figured you probably uh, were in you know knew that was coming out or whatever. So um, the other the other company I'll mention is Artista. Do you know Artista figures? Uh, yes, I am. The biggest issue with them is that they are dated. If yeah, you're well, modeling transition period or something, yeah, they, they tend not to be. They tend they tend to be more like city folk or railroad workers. But just you know, if you ever needed anybody like that, so yeah, the the biggest thing in the most of the 164 scale modeling community versus the railroad modeling community is that they're modeling is modern. They're modeling today. Um, a, there is a large young demographic, especially in the farm modeling community. There are children the age of 10, 11, 12, that would put uh, NMRA master modelers back on their heels on the quality of work that they do. Um, in especially in the farm toy world um that you know yes they're not doing rolling stock but they're scratch building buildings they're building absolutely gorgeous dioramas and they're all basing it off of what they walk out see out the door yeah i'm, I'm sure they are so, so there's a there are, there's a number of s scale uh you know there's there's a few a few i few because you know s scale model railroads are you know kind of few and far between but uh, you know, we have several modern guys who, you know, are always bemoaning the fact that everybody wants to model the fifties, but, uh, you know, they want to model today's stuff and, you know, we're getting more of it here and there. 3d printing has really been a, a boon to S scale, you know, well, these sort of small manu, you know, small scale manufacturing, you know, you can click off one when you want or whatever, you know, 3d print it or do some etching or whatever, but these, a lot of these small manufacturers are really being, uh, helpful to the S scale community. So. Oh yeah, well, and like I mean, I don't know. You are, like one of our big rolling stock guys is American Models, and I'm I'm hoping to talk to him. You know, we have a convention coming up in about a week in Buffalo. Uh, Mini Prince is supposed to be there running the clinic too, by the way. Uh, but uh, anyway, they uh, I'm hoping to talk to American Models about you know possibly doing some 3D shells that would fit on drives that they already have. You know, sort of they they're already manufacturing. I think that would be a good way to expand the line without investing a lot of quality and in, in, you know a lot of money in, in new tooling so oh yeah anyway yeah there's uh there's a lot of that i know ken ziska is going to that show um yeah i I, I have an appointment with ken ziska we have to swap some stuff <laughs> he's uh taking a as long as it gets there on time he's taking a uh, a large assortment of stuff from cornfield customs Oh, okay. Uh, they do a SW1000, SW1001, and SW1500 kit. All right. in, all for S. Uh, that are all 3D printed. And then uh, they do, like I said, figures and a lot of other small scene fillers that are universal across the 164 scale modeling area yeah so. so the other thing i wanted to say john is that i live in bethlehem as in bethlehem steel uh i don't have as much inside experience as you do with steel mills but i certainly look at them on a daily basis so <laughs> and ours ours is kind of closed down here it's become a casino and a museum but uh it was working when i moved here we John has fo followed Earl Hackett into the uh, abyss there. Yeah, I think he has. No, oh, I'm just going to bring my mic back up. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so. um, well, that's it for me tonight. You can stay longer as long as Pat wants to uh, keep the show going. And I will see you next time. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night, Good night Jim. How long do you guys want to hang on? I'm about done. So I just was, like I said, I just want to mention to John about my, my yeah, that's all right. steel mill, but uh, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but other than that, I'm going to bail. So good night. Yeah. Well, uh, Sparrow, 
when I was there in the 80s, well, I, I started, my steel career was basically early 70s through to almost 2000. Um, and I went and did other things after that. And I came to the end of a very short plank. Uh, that's another story. Um, so we were always in competition uh, with supposedly the, the one that we had to beat was Sparrow's Point because it was the one that was held up as, as being the best of the integrated steelworks uh, in terms of tons per man and what have you. It, it's somewhat ironic that Port Kimble is still running and Sparrow's Point isn't. But, oh, well, um, it's, it's more like the U.S. economy, but that's okay too. So. Yeah. Um, looking at, there was an interesting article I read online about the demise of U.S. Steel and what got it. Um, there is a significant difference between the Australian industry set up and the US industry set up in terms of who provides what. In Australia, you're responsible for providing your own superannuation, but there is a compulsory government requirement that came in in the, the 70s that required the employee employer to put X amount of your pay aside into a super fund. 